It's a week after Easter. I suppose a friend you've known for years comes over to dinner and the discussion turns to Easter and religion and your friend says, Jesus seems important to you. Why is that? Or there's someone in your kid's sports club that you've known for a while, they know you go to church, so out of the blue they ask you, what's this Christian stuff about? Or twice I've had someone I've just met say they had a girlfriend or boyfriend, it's been one of each, who's a Christian, but what they say about it doesn't convince them. What do I say about the Christian faith? When those questions happen, what do you say? What do you say? Of course, what we say depends on where our friend or new acquaintance is coming from. In Australia, roughly one third of people are either Christian or at least probably familiar with Christianity and Jesus. A second group, another third, believe there is a God or some type of spirit or life force. And the final third either know nothing at all about God or have dismissed whatever they've heard. A friend asking that sort of question is probably going to be one of the last two groups, obviously. A while ago, I presented a talk on the Apostle Paul's speech in Athens, recorded in Acts chapter 17. The people of Athens were in the third group. They knew nothing about God and hadn't heard about Jesus. Paul was the great evangelist to the non-Jewish people, so we looked at what he said to see what we could learn for when we're talking to people who don't know anything about Jesus. Act 17 helps us with that third group of Australians who know nothing about God. But what about the second group? The, th the one third of people who believe God exists or believe there is some type of God or spirit? Where do we start with them when they ask us? Well, there's another speech by Paul that I think can help us with that. It's recorded in Acts chapter 26, which we'll read in a few minutes. In it, Paul was under arrest and was called to speak to King Agrippa. The passage at first reading seems pretty straightforward, but there's quite a bit of background information that will help us to better understand what's going on in it. So settle in now for some background. The thing that always stood out to me is this. Who is King Agrippa? Why is there a king? Acts 26 is in the time of the Roman Empire. It's ruled by the emperor who has the title of Caesar. Here it's Emperor Nero. How can there be a king? And by the way, Agrippa is a Roman name used by the royal family. Why is there a king Agrippa? Well, it all becomes much clearer when I tell you Agrippa's full name. He was Herod Agrippa II. He's a Herod. And the Roman emperors allowed some of the Herods to have the title of king, even though they were subjects of the emperor. There are actually four different Herods mentioned in the Bible. Three are just called Herod, which is really confusing. And the fourth one is just called Agrippa. The first Herod mentioned in the Bible is King Herod the Great. He was an actual king of the area that included Judea and inner Jerusalem. As king, he gave his allegiance to Rome and was allowed to continue to use the title of king. He's the Herod who had all the male babies in Bethlehem massacred, as recorded in Matthew chapter 2. He died in 4 BC. Second Herod in the Bible is Herod Antipas, a son of Herod the Great. He ruled Galilee, which is north of Judea, for the Romans. He was the Herod who executed John the Baptist and who met Jesus the night before his crucifixion. The next Herod to be mentioned in the Bible is Herod Agrippa I. He was grandson of Herod the Great. He was a Jew, but he was raised in the imperial court in Rome. He was instrumental in getting his friend Claudius installed as emperor. He's a kingmaker in Rome. In return, Herod Agrippa was put in charge of Judea and Galilee to the north of it. He was a popular ruler, but when people said he was like a god, he failed to give glory to the true god, and so God struck him down and his body was eaten by worms. Yuck. You can read about that in Acts chapter 12. He died in 44 AD. That brings us to his son, Herod Agrippa II, the, the Agrippa in our passage today. I'm just going, going to call him Agrippa from now on. Like his father, Agrippa was a Jew and was raised in the imperial court in Rome under Emperor Claudius, his father's friend. Agrippa was only 17 years old when his father died, too young to take over as king of the entire Judea and Galilean kingdom. So Judea went back to having a Roman governor. After a few years, Agrippa was appointed as tetrarch, or a sort of a junior governor, of a small province called Chalcis. Sort of, here's a little province, go and play with that one. And interestingly, though, he was also given oversight of the temple in Jerusalem. He could even appoint the high priest. So while the temple, for the most part, was run by the Jewish leadership, for four or five years, Agrippa had Roman oversight of the temple. This means he got to know the Sanhedrin, with the Jewish ruling council, 
and the other Jewish leaders and he experienced the Jewish politics and the Jewish relationship with Rome. And also, Agrippa must surely have heard about Jesus during that time. Around the time that, Claud uh, that Claudius died and Nero took over as emperor, Agrippa was moved away from Jerusalem and instead was made ruler over the seven areas to the north and northeast of Judea. He was appointed as a Roman client king. That is, he was given the title of king, but he reported to Emperor Nero just like any other governor. I assume Agrippa knew Nero. Nero was 10 years younger than him, but Agrippa would have been well acquainted with him from his time growing up in the imperial court in Rome. So that's who King Agrippa is. He's the Roman governor of the territories next door to Judea, and the emperor has allowed him to use the title of king. He was raised as a Jew. He might have been a, a God-fearing, practicing Jew. Paul seems to think so. Agrippa also had five years experience overseeing the temple in Jerusalem and dealing with the Jewish leadership and Jewish politics. He was also raised in the imperial court in Rome. Agrippa spans two worlds, Judea and Rome. Keep all that in mind for the moment and let's turn our attention to Paul for a moment. For this passage, the key thing to keep in mind is that Paul is a Roman citizen. He was born in Tarsus in modern day Turkey but a number of cities in the Roman Empire were granted Roman citizenship, including Tarsus. Being a Roman citizen gave Paul certain rights, including the right of trial and appeal in the courts of law and the right of appeal to the emperor. This is like we have in our legal system. I mean, guess where we got it from? You're, if you're in court and you're found guilty but there's some discrepancy in the legal process, you can appeal to a higher court for them to hear your case. There are a few levels, but ultimately you get to the Australian High Court and what they say goes, guilty or not guilty. For Roman citizens, the highest appeal was the emperor himself. With all that background, let's pick up the story so far. This starts in Acts chapter 21. Paul was in Jerusalem, there was a riot. The Roman commander provided Paul with military protection because he was a Roman citizen. Paul addressed the Jewish Sanhedrin or ruling council and another riot happened. Some Jews plotted to kill Paul so the Roman commander assembled 470 troops to protect Paul and sent him to the Roman governor Felix in the city of Caesarea which was the Roman administrative capital of Judea, not, Ju not Jerusalem but they ruled from Caesarea. Paul was there for two years. Uh, Felix, even amongst Roman governors, Felix was notorious for bribery and was probably hoping Paul would bribe him to be released. That brings us to the end of chapter 24. Around the year 59 AD, like 59 give or take one year, Felix was replaced as governor by procurator Porcius Festus. Two weeks later, Paul was presented to Festus and we pick up the story from Acts chapter 25 verse 9 which Danica will read to us now. Good morning, so today I'll be reading Acts chapter 25 verse 9 to chapter 26 verse 32. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favour, replied to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem to be tried before me where there on these charges? Paul replied, I am standing at Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as even you know yourself very well. It, if then I did anything wrong and am deserving of death, I am not trying to escape death. But if there is nothing to what these men accuse me of, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then after Festus, Festus conferred with his counsel, he replied, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. King Agrippa and Bernice visit Festus. Several days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived in Caesarea and paid a courtesy call to Fe on Festus. Since they were standing th staying there several days, Festus presented Paul's case to the king, saying, There is a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews presented their case and asked that he be condemned. I answered them that it is not the Roman custom to give someone up, before the accused faces the accusers and has an opportunity for a defense against the charges. So then, so when they had assembled there, I did not delay. The next day I took my seat at the tribunal and ordered the men to be brought in. The accusers stood up but brought no charge against him of the evils I was expecting. Instead they had some disagreements with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus a dead man Paul claimed to be alive. <laughs> 
Since I was at, at a loss in, the, in a dispute over such things, I asked him if he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding these matters. But when Paul appealed to be held for trial by the emperor, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I could send him to Caesar. Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow you will hear him, he replied. Paul before Agrippa. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the auditorium with the military commanders and prominent men of the city. When Festus gave the command, Paul was brought in. Then Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has appealed to me concerning him, both in Jerusalem and here, <coughs> shouting that he should not live any longer. I found that he had not done anything deserving of death. Uh, but when he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. I have nothing definite to write to my lord about him. <coughs> Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after this examination is over, I may have something to write. For it seems unreasonable to me to send a prisoner without indicating the charges against him. Paul's defense before Agrippa. Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa. I am to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially since you are very knowledgeable about all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. All the Jews may know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my people and in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand on trial because of the hope in what God promised to our ancestors, the promise our 12 tribes hope to reach as they earnestly serve him day and night. King Agrippa, I am being accused by the Jews because of this hope. Why do any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? In fact, I myself was convinced that it was necessary to do many things in oppo opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I actually did this in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority from that from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I was in agreement against them, in all the synagogues, I often punished them and tried to make them blaspheme. Since I was terribly enraged at them, I pursued them even in foreign cities. Paul's account of his conversation and commission. I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances with authority and a commission from the chief priests. King Agrippa, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from the heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice speak to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? I asked, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, but get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness and sin of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So when King Agrippa, so then King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea, and to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do the works worthy of repentance. For the reason the Jews seized me in the temple and were trying to kill me, to this very day I have had help from God and I stand to test and testify to both small and great, not saying nothing 
other than what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah would suffer and that as the first to rise from the dead, he will proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. Agrippa not quite persuaded. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, you're out of your mind, Paul. Too much studying is driving you mad. <laughs> but Paul replied, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters and I can speak boldly to him. For I am convinced that none of these things has escaped his notice, since this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? I wish before God, Paul re replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not you but all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. The king, the governor, Bernice, and those sitting with them got up, and when they had left, they talked with each other and said, this man is not doing anything to deserve death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. Thanks, Danica. I put her through that, didn't I? <laughs> Selecting that passage. <laughs> but thank you. That was good. This passage is an eyewitness account by Luke. As most of you know, Luke wrote the gospel that bears his name and he wrote the sequel that is the book of Acts. But partway through Acts, Luke joins Paul and travels with him. So Luke was present at the meeting in our passage. You can tell that by the way he describes it. Two private discussions between Agrippa and Festus are also recorded. Uh, I presume someone in their entourage supplied that information to Luke. This is eyewitness history. It took place around the year 59 AD. Festus had just started as governor of Judea and we know he took over that role around 59 AD. In chapter 25, Paul was presented to Festus. We read, uh, we read that Festus wanted to do the Jewish leaders a favour, I guess to make a positive start with them, and asked Paul if he would be willing to stand trial before Festus, but in Jerusalem instead of Caesarea where he already was. Some Jews were planning to ambush and murder Paul along the way to Jerusalem, so Paul couldn't agree to that, and to avoid Festus sending him to Jerusalem. As a last resort, Paul appealed for his case to be heard by the emperor, which was his right as a Roman citizen. He protect, this protected him by Roman law. Neither Festus nor the Jews could harm Paul now. And Festus now had no choice. He had to send Paul to Emperor Nero in Rome. But Festus now has a problem. He's new in Judea. He doesn't know the Jewish religion, the Jewish leadership or the Jewish politics. He doesn't understand what Paul has been charged with. It's Jewish stuff and it makes no sense under Roman law. He has to send Paul to Rome, but he can't send him to the emperor without any explanation of what Paul's been charged with. That would be, no, that would be what's today known as a CLM, a career-limiting move. Uh, Festus needs to write an explanation to Emperor Nero saying what Paul has been charged with, but he hasn't the foggiest clue what to write. Festus has a problem. Enter Agrippa. 25 verse 13, Agrippa arrives in Caesarea to pay a courtesy diplomatic visit to Festus. This is just a routine visit to welcome the new governor of the province next door to Agrippa's domain. It's the same as if you have a new next door neighbour. You pop in and introduce yourself to welcome them, don't you? That's what Agrippa is doing. Incidentally, if you're wondering about Bernice, she was Agrippa's sister and the two of them went everywhere together. They came as a package deal. Agrippa's visit may be routine, but Agrippa is the answer to Festus's problem with Paul. Agrippa is a Jew, he understands the Jewish religion, so he can work out what Paul is accused of. He's overseen the temple for five years, so he knows the Jewish leaders and the Jewish politics that led to Paul's arrest. But Agrippa is also raised in the imperial court in Rome, probably knows Emperor Nero, certainly knows how the imperial court works. Agrippa is the perfect person to advise Festus what to write to the emperor about Paul when he sends him there. As Festus says from chapter 25, verse 25, when Paul appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. <laughs> Actually, he had no choice. I have nothing definite to write to my lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after this examiner examination is over, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner without indicating the charges against him. You can say that again. 
To give that advice, Agrippa has to hear from Paul to find out what he's accused of. So that's what happens. Notice, and this is important, and it's often misunderstood, Paul is not on trial here. His only trial will be before Emperor Nero in Rome. This meeting is just that, a meeting, an interview. Of course, what Paul says will have a bearing on what is written to Nero about him, so it's important to Paul that he establishes his innocence to Agrippa. On the other hand, Agrippa just wants to find out the situation with Paul so he can advise Festus what to write to Nero when he sends Paul to him. So he gives Paul freedom to say whatever he likes. You see that in chapter 26, verse 1. Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Paul now has an audience of two Roman governors, one known to the emperor himself, plus all the other people in the room. But he speaks particularly to Agrippa, because as he says in verse 3, Agrippa is very knowledgeable about all the Jewish customs and controversies. So what does Paul say to someone who knows about God but doesn't know Jesus? Agrippa is a Jew. He knows the scriptures, our Old Testament. In particular, he knows the prophets, and they are the ones who foretold the coming Messiah or Christ. Agrippa doubtless heard about Jesus in his five years overseeing the temple, but he doesn't know Jesus for himself. We don't know if he had heard that people claimed Jesus was the Messiah, but if he had heard that, he wasn't convinced yet. As we go through, keep in mind why we're looking at this passage. What does Paul, the great evangelist, say about Jesus to someone who knows about God, has maybe heard about Jesus, but isn't a Christian? And what can we learn from Paul when we're answering a friend who knows about God or some spirit, has maybe heard about Jesus, but isn't a Christian? And if you're someone who hasn't yet committed your life to Jesus, I'm, I'm guessing you've at least heard about Jesus or you wouldn't be here, just take in and think about what Paul says to Agrippa, who was in a sort of similar situation to you. So let's look at what Paul says. Paul starts by establishing common ground with Agrippa. In verses 4 and 5, he outlines his life as a Pharisee, the strict and predominant sect of Judaism. Agrippa would be familiar with this. As, and in verse 8, Agrippa would know the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, so that claim would be unremarkable to him. Common ground. Next, Paul links his message to what Agrippa knows. He links the charges against him with fundamental Jewish beliefs. In verse 6, I stand on trial because of the hope in what God promised to our ancestors, the promise our 12 tribes hope to reach. Paul establishes a direct connection between the promises in the scriptures, our Old Testament, and what the Jewish leaders were accusing him of. Paul asserts that his message is a consequence and fulfilment of what the Old Testament established. Paul then presents his personal testimony, to put it in modern terms. Firstly, in verse 9 to 12, he outlines his life as a faithful, zealous Pharisee, particularly his role in persecuting the early Christians. In verses 12 to 18, Paul describes how Jesus miraculously appeared to him. In verse 13, he emphasises that he's telling this to Agrippa in particular. Paul is describing his personal experience of Jesus. Perhaps Agrippa could disagree or agree on theology or points of law, but Agrippa cannot deny the reality of Paul's personal experience. Moreover, Paul's testimony isn't about some random itinerant teacher wandering Judea. Rather, it's a miraculous and supernatural revelation by a resurrected Messiah. Those are unequivocal credentials that Jesus is the promised Messiah or Christ. Jesus appointed Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, people like us. Verses 17 and 18, Jesus said to him, I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus. This commission is crystal clear, and it's what so angered the Jewish leaders. They liked to believe that salvation was unique to the Jews, the physical descendants of Abraham. To them, it was almost blasphemous to say salvation could be given to non-Jews. Also, having salvation offered to people everywhere would undermine the power and prestige that the Jewish leadership enjoyed. These things were the basis of the Jewish attacks on Paul, and the miraculous revelation by Jesus undermines their charges. Paul is relying on Agrippa's knowledge of the scriptures to see that what Jesus has commissioned him to do is, in fact, 
consistent with the Old Testament scriptures and therefore Paul was in the right and his accusers were wrong. In his letters, Paul explains how the Old Testament shows God's purpose in establishing the Jews as his own people was for the message of salvation to go out from the Jews to the whole world. For example, you can read about that in Romans chapter 9. Agrippa will have recognised that Paul is claiming Jesus to be the Messiah. The promises in verse 18 to open eyes and turn from darkness to light, they are directly Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah. To wrap up his testimony, verses 19 to 20, Paul states that he was simply obedient to what Jesus demanded of him. Paul's testimony is one thing, but now he goes on to relate it to the common ground that he's established with Agrippa. Verses 22 and 23, Paul comes to the core of his speech. In those verses he said, To this very day I have had help from God, and I stand and testify to both small and great, saying nothing other than what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah would suffer, and that as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. Paul started by establishing common ground with Agrippa's knowledge of Judaism and linking his message with the scriptures that Agrippa knew. Now in these verses, he builds on this common ground to convince Agrippa of the truth of what he's saying. Firstly, God has helped him. He is not fighting against God. Rather, God is supporting Paul. If you believe in God, as Agrippa does, this is important authentication for Paul's message. Secondly, Paul specifically calls on the Old Testament prophets who were the ones who foretold the coming of the Messiah. He's relying on Agrippa knowing the scriptures very well. There were plenty of passages in Isaiah and some of the minor prophets that clearly look forward to the coming Messiah, as all Jews knew. But only some of those passages present the Messiah as a suffering servant. And only a few talk about uh, the Messiah taking salvation to the Jews and Gentiles alike. The passages are there, but most Jews skipped around them and looked for a triumphant military Messiah who would end the Roman occupation of Judea. Paul is relying on Agrippa having a deep knowledge of the scriptures. And why not? Agrippa is a lifelong Jew who has even overseen the Jerusalem temple. And he also had the best education available in the Roman Empire at the imperial court. It's not unreasonable for Paul to call on deep scripture knowledge by Agrippa to recognise that the Messiah would come as a suffering servant, as Jesus did. In short, Paul is relating his message to the scriptures that Agrippa knows. And from those scriptures, Paul reasons that Jesus offers salvation not just to the Jews, but also to Gentiles like us, the very thing that so infuriated the Jewish leadership. But at this point, Paul has gone beyond what Festus can make sense of. I mean, he probably did that right from the start, who knows. The outburst by Festus in verse 24 is rather undiplomatic, seeing Paul is talking mainly to Agrippa. Nevertheless, Paul responds courteously to Festus, firstly out of respect to his position, but secondly, and more importantly, to avoid getting sidetracked. Verses 26 and 27 are what today we might call an altar call, an invitation to Agrippa to accept Jesus as the Messiah and therefore as his personal saviour. He said, For the king knows about these matters, and I can speak boldly to him. For I am convinced that none of these things have escaped his notice, since this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Paul knows that Agrippa knows the Old Testament scriptures. And seeing Agrippa spent five years overseeing the temple in Jerusalem, surely he heard about Jesus during that time. The claims about Jesus can't have escaped his notice. The message about Jesus was not hidden away in some corner. Verse 27 is the punchline, for want of a better word. Paul is saying to Agrippa that seeing he believes the prophets, he must see that what Paul is saying is the fulfilment of the Old Testament scriptures and Jesus is the Messiah, and that Agrippa owes him his personal allegiance. Agrippa knows what he's asking too. Verse 28 makes that clear. Unfortunately, the outburst by Festus puts Agrippa in a difficult spot. He understands Paul's reasoning, maybe even tends to agree with him. But Agrippa can hardly be seen to agree with a man Festus has just called mad. So he gives a diplomat's answer to avoid answering the question directly. When he says to Paul in verse 28, Are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? In the final two verses, we can see that Agrippa, Festus and the others agreed that Paul had done nothing deserving of death or imprisonment. 
The verdict is clear in verse 32. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. Incidentally, I wonder if there's more than just a verdict here. On one hand, this could be gentle criticism of Festus by Agrippa. Because if Festus hadn't cornered Paul by trying to take him to Jerusalem, Paul wouldn't have appealed to Caesar and he could have gone free. Effectively, Agrippa might be saying Festus forced Paul into chains. On the other hand, it might be friendly advice by Festus to Agrippa, sorry, to Festus by Agrippa, who had five years dealing with the Jewish leaderships. Maybe he was advising Festus not to be overly anxious to please the Jewish leaders, or he might end up with a bigger problem than just one citizen unjustly imprisoned. But that's just speculation on my part. What is important to Luke is that Agrippa declared Paul innocent of the charges against him. And that's what he would have advised Festus to write to Emperor Nero. So, remember what we're, looking, what we're looking for in this passage? What can we say when a friend asks us about Christianity or Jesus? And they know something about God and maybe about Jesus? What can we learn from Paul's speech to Agrippa? Clearly, the centerpiece of what Paul says is his personal testimony, how he came to be a Christian, the commission Jesus gave him, and how he has been obedient to that task. But that's not what he starts with. Paul's first step was to establish common ground. What do we know about what the other person believes? We might already know that if the person has been a friend for some time. Otherwise, we might need to ask questions to work it out. Do they know about the God of the Bible or some other God who maybe sounds similar but is actually quite different? Do they know about Jesus? What do they know about him? For that matter, do they trust what's in the Bible? For example, Paul knew Agrippa trusted our Old Testament and knew the prophecies about Jesus. After all that, what do we both agree on? What is our common ground? That's our starting point, or so Paul's example would suggest. Paul's next step was to link his gospel message to that common ground. So we can talk in general terms about how the gospel relates to whatever our common ground is with our friend. That may be more than one conversation, it may be over weeks or months, that together with our friend we can build that common ground into more of a foundation for the gospel. Only then does Paul present his personal testimony to Agrippa. Maybe we can do likewise. Paul testimony, Paul's testimony itself lines up with the usual pattern. Life, bef life before Jesus, what made him a Christian, how his life changes as a result, and living in obedience to what uh, Jesus called him to. Uh, same for us. Importantly, Paul's testimony was about his personal experience, and I think so should ours be. People can argue about facts and interpretations, but they can't disagree to our face about our personal experience. Our society sees personal experience as truth. Our friend can't disagree with our personal experience, or Jesus at work in our lives, or what it's like to have the Holy Spirit living within us. If it applies to you, maybe describe your life before Jesus and the difference in your life now, just as Paul did. Paul also included the resurrection of Jesus. Yes, it's supernatural, but Jesus coming back to life authenticated to Agrippa that Jesus wasn't just some random wandering teacher. No, it proves Jesus comes with the power of God. Just the same, we shouldn't shy away from the supernatural. Many people today are actually quite receptive to the supernatural. Jesus coming back to life is supernatural, but it is also vital to our witness. Jesus is alive and knowable right now. His resurrection is key. The hope Jesus offers that we can tell people about is the hope of resurrection. There is more than just this life on earth, and eternity is available to them. People want to live forever. We're wired that way ever since we were made. Jesus is how it can happen for them. And explaining, people that Jesus came, explaining to people that Jesus came back to life authenticates him as the one who had power over death and can give us eternal life. It authenticates him as the Son of God and our Saviour. But a testimony will only explain to our friend why Jesus is important to us. We need to help them understand why he's important to them too. I think that'll be very different for each friend. But basically, basically Paul relates his testimony to the common ground he established with Agrippa. That's probably a good pattern for us too. By relating our testimony to the common ground we've established together with our friend, they may see why Jesus is so important, not only to us, but also to them. And finally, at an appropriate time, we should ask them if they are ready to commit their life, their eternity, to Jesus. 
I think Paul rushes that in our passage, but he only had one meeting, one speech. Even so, he didn't leave the question unasked, hoping Agrippa would maybe meet some other Christian sometime who would finally convince him. No, Paul took the only opportunity he would have to put the question to Agrippa. Would he turn to Jesus? Paul didn't get an answer. He could only hope and pray that Agrippa would think and pray more about the question. After all, we turn to Christ by the grace of God, not by human persuasion. But we shouldn't leave the question unasked of our friend when it becomes appropriate. A couple of other points we can take from what Paul says to Agrippa. Paul presents the basic key points of the gospel, nothing more. He had limited time and just one occasion, so he sticks to the basics. Hopefully anyone we can present the gospel to will either have more time or we can meet with them more than once. But if it's short, we probably should just follow Paul's example and present the basics. And in verse 29, Paul is aware of the other people listening. We do well to be aware of who else is listening and what they might hear. Are there opportunities to follow up with them later for any questions they might have? So what do you think of all that? Does that make sense? Do, those, do you think those are things that are reasonable to take away from Paul's speech with Agrippa? We'll have a discussion time in shortly where you can mull that over together. But before our discussion time, I'd like to take a quick moment to compare Paul's speeches in Acts 17 and 26. My, uh, my talk on chapter 17 is on our church website under sermons. Just search under my name and you'll see it. But a very quick recap of Acts 17. <coughs> Paul addressed a public meeting of philosophers in Athens. He had seen a temple inscribed to an unknown God. His speech was basically, you Greeks worship, Greeks worship an unknown God because you're worried you might offend him if you don't. There actually is a God you don't know and you actually have offended him. Uh, he's the most important God and you have offended him and he has sent a man to judge you for that and authenticated that man by raising him from the dead. That's Acts, Acts chapter 17 in 10 seconds. Act, in Acts 17, Paul's audience knew nothing about God or Jesus, like one third of Australians. In Acts 26, Agrippa knows God and the scriptures but doesn't know Jesus. A bit like another one third of Australians. Maybe not the scripture knowledge, but something about God. Paul's two speeches have a lot in common, as the table on the screen shows. The table shortly on the screen will show. Uh, it's in your newsletter as well. A remarkable difference is that in Athens, Paul didn't even mention Jesus by name. Jesus wasn't their starting point. He wasn't where people could take their first step towards God from. And Paul presented Jesus only as a judge, not as a saviour. With Agrippa, Paul adapts the gospel message very differently. He mentions Jesus by name and links Jesus to the Old Testament prophecy that Agrippa knew. But the biggest difference, I think, is that Paul gives Agrippa his personal testimony about his conversion. Paul doesn't give a testimony in Athens to people who knew nothing about God. Interesting. And very important, in both places, Paul highlights the resurrection of Jesus that we just celebrated last week. The resurrection authenticates Jesus. He really is the Son of God. When we're first presenting the gospel to someone, do we mention the resurrection? Or are we worried we might put people off and we leave it for later? Both times, Paul highlighted the resurrection in his first talk with people about Jesus. We probably should too. Let's pray briefly. Father, please fill us with your love and care for people who are asking us about you, people we've known for years or people you bring to us just once. We dedicate ourselves to your service to be your spokespeople, your ambassadors, to represent Jesus and the hope he offers now and for eternity. Move us with your love and compassion for people who don't know you yet. Amen.